I will not talk too much about the model itself, but I would like to concentrate myself on something what is really new in the model, what is, what is maybe different compared with other CTMs. And this is uh, related to the transport, to the vertical transport. So we use diabetic heating rates, roughly speaking, for the vertical transport. We'll talk a little bit about this. The second point is Lagrangian mi uh, mixing. That is very unique and clumps. And uh, it's, uh, you can imagine uh, if you follow with the trajectories your air parcels and you want to mix is this air parcels, uh, it's, it's something challenging. So this is maybe the second part, what I would like to shortly introduce. And then I will jump to the kind of recent application of the model, to the uh, analysis of the transpo uh, transport pathways from the summer monsoon into the stratosphere. OK, so let us start. Maybe our first application of the model was uh, during the SOLV campaign, which took place 2000. So it was a campaign devoted to the ozone loss in the northern hemisphere, in the polar vortex. And um, so it's a kind of our, of our first, uh, first approaches. You see the clumps methane distribution at 450K potential temperature. You see many small scale structure. You see the filaments and uh, you can also uh, recognize the flight of the ER2, which uh, was here this way. And um, if you take the observation of the methane from the Argus instrument, so it looks like this, this is the, the black line, and the clumps uh, simulation is, agrees very well with the uh, observation. And you see also the small filaments. This is this, this type uh, here of... Uh, methane distribution that was resolved by the model. It was observed, and it was our kind of first success, that in this Lagrangian approach, you can resolve such small-scale structures. And um, this was our kind of starting point for the application which followed, uh, roughly speaking, by this uh, type of analysis. I will not talk too much about the chemistry. You know, the chemistry is also a big part of the model. Jens-Uwe Gross and uh, Rolf Miller are very concerned with the chemistry, especially with the concern for the, uh, with the chemistry for the polar vortex. I will concentrate mainly on the kind of long-term simulations with clumps and on the application for the Asian monsoon. OK, so uh, this is, once again, this, this place where we uh, resolve these fine filaments. Only that you get some feeling for the model. We have many, many chemical species which, when, which we can run in this uh, long-term version of the model that can run over uh, 40 years and is driven by different types of the reanalysis. We have methane, mean H, CO2, CO, ozone, HCl, water vapor, N2O, F11, F12, HCN. We have a simplified chemistry, and the simplified chemistry allows us to run the model in the sufficiently high resolution over 40 years. OK, so let us go now to this new things in clumps that is uh, related to the Lagrangian transport, diabetic, I call it diabetic sinking and mixing. So if you, if you go to the equations, you know, if you want to uh, resolve transport, you need velocities. And uh, the common way to calculate the, velo the velocities is, is the so-called kinematic approach. So you calculate the vertical velocity, roughly speaking, from the mass conservation, from the divergence equation. So if u and v are prescribed, you know it's from, uh, from, the, uh, from the calculation of the... Of the uh, of the impulse budget, uh, you can derive the W, the vertical ve velocity, from this equation. And of course, this kinematic velocity is also mass conserving. That is the biggest advantage of this vertical velocity. But we don't use this approach. What we are uh, doing, we, we follow this, the so-called diabetic vertical velocities. Diabetic means first that we use the potential temperature as a vertical coordinate. Potential temperature is a conserved quantity. So, you know, it's uh, on the time scales of few days, especially if you have different types of waves, the potential temperature is conserved. So it's always uh, good in the physics, you probably know it's from the physics, is that if you have a conserved quantity, it's good to use this conserved quantity as a coordinate. 
If you do it, you can uh, simplify uh, uh, your mathematical calculation because this coordinate is conserved. So this is, uh, roughly speaking, the motivation to use the potential temperature as a vertical co coordinate. And then if you go to this coordinate system where the, the potential temperature is a, is, is a vertical coordinate, you need the cross isentropic velocities, which are uh, uh, the main part of this diabatic thinking. So you, you need uh, uh, something that describes the vertical ve velocities. And of course, if you go into the equations, you, you will find that uh, this vertical velocity, this cross isentropic motion, especially in the stratosphere, but it's also valid for the, for the warm atmosphere, is driven by the short wave radiation, long wave radiation, latent heat, and maybe some uh, other terms like turbulent dif uh, diffusion. At this place, you also see the advantage of this, of this vertical coordinate. If you use this kinematic vertical velocity, you can calculate it from the, from the residuum. And always, because you know the horizontal velocities are very, very large, this vertical, this vertical velocity is very, very small, you get always a kind of uh, noise by the calculation of this vertical velocity. And especially if you go to the reanalysis, this uh, uh, adjusting of the horizontal velocities also transform to the vertical velocity, and that means you, you get a very high noise of the vertical ve velocity. Another disadvantage of this ve vertical velocity is uh, if it doesn't work. So if your if your transport is not correct, you don't really know what is the physical reason for this. If you go to this diabatic approach, you have very f physical terms, that, so you can say maybe the short wave radiation is not well represented in the model, or maybe the latent heat that is maybe the, the contribution of the convection. And in this way, you can pin down your problem to some physical problem or to some, to some f uh, physical um, uh, questions which, uh, which drive the vertical velocity. Of course, you, you know it's, it's a, a Isentropic coordinates cannot be extended down to the Earth. So you have to couple this isentropic coordinate somewhere with something that is uh, orography following. And this is what, uh, what we also do. We use uh, the hybrid vertical velocities, which couple the potential temperature and the orography following co uh, coordinates. That is a P over PS, and PS is surface pressure. This is, uh, by the way, what we learned from this Machowald paper, GGR, and it was my first recommendation, what I got 2002 as I visited the first time uh, here. Take this paper, this is the answer for your problem, how to couple the isentropic uh, coordinate with the orography following coordinate. So only to say how this collaboration worked, let's start it. <laughs> okay, so this is, um, and how does it work? So you can see if you take the subtropical jet, you have the, the green lines are the isentropes, the potential temperature surfaces, and the red lines are the uh, this orography following coordinates, P over PS. And then you have to couple these two coordinates, the stem, uh, uh, these two uh, 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 coordinates in order to get this hybrid uh, vertical velocity. OK, so this is what we are doing. Uh, we uh, have the transformation, something like above 300 hectopascal. So above this 300 hectopascal, we use a, a pure isentropic or pure diabatic sinking. Below 300 hectopascal, it is, it is a kind of mixture between the diabatic sinking and the kind of classical pressure-related sinking. This is the part related to the vertical velocities. It's not completely new in clumps, but uh, there are many models which use this vertical, uh, this kinematic vertical velocities. We try to do it as much as possible to uh, go into this diabatic world, even if we, if we go to the troposphere. OK, Lagrangian mixing is the second part that is uh, also very important, and it's uh, related to the numerical uh, diffusion. So um, if you go to the stratosphere, you are, of course, aware the stratosphere is, is uh, stable, stratified. So every vertical fluctuation is, is dumped. And that means you have a very small vertical mixing. 
as a result, you get a various kind of strong 2D flow, this chaotic advection driven by the horizontal winds. Everything looks like, um, like uh, in the, in the uh, if you would paint with different colors you, and mix two different colors, you, you get this type of filaments. And if you compare it with the picture what I showed you at the beginning, this is also how the stratosphere looks like. So uh, the stratospheric transport is dominated by the horizontal winds and due to the strong stable stratification, the vertical mo uh, motion is, is suppressed. The typical way in the atmospheric physics is to use Eulerian models. And in the Eulerian models, you have to uh, struggle or you have, to, uh, you have the problem with the uh, numerical diffusion. Because of the current criterion, and uh, if you enhance the resolution of the model, you have to enhance also the frequency of the interpolation on your, uh, on your background grid. This, this frequency or the high frequency of the interpolation on your background grid produces a very high numerical diffusion. And this is only shown here for a kind of uh, well-known picture. So if you start with a, a rectangular distribution and, and uh, follow it in the time, in the uniform flow, and always uh, interpolate it on the background grid, you, you, you get from this uh, rectangular impulse something like the Gaussian distribution, and this Gaussian distribution will be wider and wider, and this is a consequence of the numerical dif uh, uh, diffusion. So what is the advantage of the Lagrangian thinking? I formulated this this way. One of the most intriguing features offered by the Lagrangian transport is the possibility to parameterize the true physical mixing in terms of the numerical diffusion. So instead of uh, kind of fighting against the numerical diffusion, you can now use the numerical diffusion to parameterize the true physical mixing. And this is what we implemented in CLAMS. It is something what we what we included into the model, and. Uh, so what we use is a so-called grid, grid adaptation, and this grid adaptation means first we have to or we have to handle irregular grid. So you have kind of irregular uh, distribution of the uh, of the air parcels, and uh, um, we use the so-called Deluni triangulation to find the next neighbors. This is always important in handling of the grid. It is a kind of mathematical procedure. And if, we, if you put this kind of grid into the flow, into a kind of shared flow, you get this type of the distribution. And now what we are doing, we, we say, if, if you take the next, the next neighbors and you follow the next neighbors, and the distance between the next neighbors is becoming too large or becoming too, uh, too small, and this is because you have some strong deformation in the flow, we put into the grid additional grid points and interpolate on these grid points. And this interpolation is, of course, numerical diffusion. And because we couple it with the deformation in the flow, we say it has a kind of physical character or physical background. So this grid adaptation is a kind of regridding of the de deformed grid. We include new air parcels, and these interpolations uh, produce mixing numerical mixing, which can be also interpreted as a, as a physical mixing. So to quantify the deformation, we, we use a so-called Lyapunov exponent. So the Lyapunov exponent is a parameter which measures the deformation of a circle in a flow. So if you start with a circle and deform it in the flow, you get a kind of ellipse. And from the, uh, from the change of this uh, ellipse parameters are plus and are minus, you can calculate this Lyapunov exponent, and that means um, if the deformation uh, is strong, you get high Lyapunov exponents. If the deformation is weak, you get low Lyapunov exponent. And this is what we are doing in the model. So we, we couple now the deformation in the flow, which are kind of combination of the horizontal and vertical deformations. And if this deformation are sufficiently strong, we put new air parcels into the scheme and interpolate on these air parcels, and this is what we call mixing. So <clears throat> what you see is a one example here at 350 K potential temperature, subtropical jet over Himalaya, with a very strong wind, so you have the horizontal winds. 
and uh, you can calculate this deformation, this Lyapunov exponents, and you see in the vicinity of the jet, always these deformations are very strong. And uh, now you see where we put the, uh, uh, this new air passes in the model, where we interpolate, and this is where we include mixing in the model. Roughly speaking, on these places where this combination of the vertical and horizontal deformation is very, very strong. So this is, you know, something like a combination of the pragmatic approach, because, you know, you want to have a kind of constant number of air parcels, you want to describe your flow in a constant way, you want to include something like the mixing that produce uh, irreversible uh, distribution of the of the species, especially if you take the tracer-tracer correlations, you can recognize that such uh, uh, mixing lines can be formed in this type of the scheme, and this is what we what we do. Okay, this is what I wanted to show you about the about the model itself. The second part of my talk is uh, kind of application for the uh, Asian summer monsoon or for the summer monsoon's uh, pathway of transport or related pathway of trans transport from the monsoon region to the stratosphere. Um, this is, um, so let me start with the motivation. Asian summer monsoon, stratosphere, why we should care, probably it's not necessary to convince here somebody. It's uh, something that uh, Bill published in his science paper, the distribution of, of uh, HCN, showing um, a very kind of characteristic uh, climatology, uh, climatology for J, J, JJA, climatology of, of HCN. So it's HCN is here average, uh, average over uh, between zero and 100 degree east. So it's, uh, the question what is discussed in this topic is um, uh, the monsoon circulation provides an effective pathway for pollution from Asia and Indonesia to enter the global stratosphere, mainly CO, HCN, CO2, and aerosols, but also CO2 and water vapor are transported into the stratosphere. The question is how much and uh, do we understand all this pathway? So the questions which I will discuss in the following part of my presentation is how much of the polluted air goes into the deep stratosphere, into the tropical pipe, and how much goes into the extratropical uh, lower stratosphere, something like in this picture, how much goes into the northern hemisphere, lower most stratosphere, how much goes into the tropical pipe, and qu can we quantify these two pathways of transport? That is something that uh, we uh, try to quantify now with, the, with this model, with clumps. It's a, from, it's, it's a kind of jump from my first part of, of the presentation, what I showed you maybe the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the physical background of the model to the application we, where we want to quantify the transport. In between, we publish many papers validating this model. So, you know, I will not, I, I cannot show uh, everything. So, if you are not familiar with the model, you can, you, uh, you, you should know it, what, it was validated for many special cases and for many situations. So now we want to apply it uh, as a kind of diagnostic tool to quantify the amount of transport into the, into the stratosphere. So I will continue with a paper which was published 2017, uh, Plüger et al, quantifying pollution transport from the Asian monsoon anticyclone into the lower stratosphere. And uh, the method is, of course, we use the model CLAMS that is driven by the error interim. The resolution is something like 100, kilo, uh, uh, 100 kilometer horizontal and 400 meter vertical around the tropopause. And we use the monsoon tracer following the Orbe et al. paper 2013. It's a, the so-called air mass origin tracer. So roughly speaking, the air passes are set to one in some uh, uh, defined source region, and then we want to understand how much of this tracer is in, uh, can be found in different destination regions. So um, what we are doing now uh, every day between July and August of the year 2010, 2013, we initialize the tracer so for two months. So we put for two months between uh, in, the, in the anticyclone core between 370 and 380K. 
So in this layer, we put the stressor to one for two months, and we do it over uh, four years, and uh, four years in order to get a kind of climatology of transport. And um, we do it within the uh, anticyclone, and the edge of the anticyclone is de defined by the kind of Nash criterion for the, uh, like for the, uh, for the vortex edge, you know that the, uh, if you take the Nash criterion, it's a, uh, you have to find the place where the derivation of PV with respect to the equivalent latitude has a maximum. It is also a transport barrier. Something s similar you can do also for the anticyclone, for the Asian monsoon anticyclone, that it's this sense is also very similar to the polar vortex. And it's this way you can define the edge of the anticyclone and put this tracer in this way. So here once again, uh, to the method, so if you see here at 380K, the calculated edge of the anticyclone is this black line, and these red points are the points which we set to one in the models, these are Lagrangian air parcels, and we do it over two months and check the propagation of the signal into the stratosphere. So it's... Um, <clears throat> There are also here this uh, green points. I will not talk about this too much because we also investigated in the paper uh, the region uh, around the edge, but I will concentrate only on the, on the uh, result uh, which were, uh, which, which were uh, uh, obtained by this type of configuration. So PDF, uh, here what you see is a, is a Tropopause potential temperature, uh, PDF, in the monsoon anticyclone from all days during July, August. So you see that the tropopause is very high in the, in the Asian anticyclone. And th this is the uh, source region where we put our tracer between 370 and 380 K. And so the tropopause is mainly above. And so it's like we put our source region close to the to the tropopause. We did also some simulations uh, to, to check the sensi sensitivity by uh, redefining this upper layer by the, by the tropopause, by the differences are very small to that what I will show you. So the source region is something like uh, below the tropopause between 370 and 380 K and high enough between the main convective outflow that is something like at 360K. This is, uh, the motivation was also because, you know, the model is still not well proven for the tropospheric transport, for the transport driven by convection. So we are only interested on the transport from the main convective outflow into the stratosphere and not from the surface to the main convective outflow. So, Klamus versus, versus HCN, that is what also Bill did in his paper. So, this, you see once again Bill's paper with the HCN distribution. And now you can follow the evolution of this uh, artificial tracer in Klamus. It's uh, for uh, July, August, September, also JAS. You see how the tracer goes up. You see also this dashed lines is the HCN derived from the satellite and uh, from the ASFTS uh, satellite. And if you go uh, later in time, it's October, November, December, you see how the tracer propagates upwards. Uh, it's um, January, February, March, and, and April, May, and June. And you see that after something like eight months of the propagation, so the tracer was released below the tropopause, roughly speaking, crossed the tropopause, and went in the zonal mean picture into the tropical pipe. And you see it's a very good agreement with this uh, HCN, what was also discussed by Bill. And what, at least if you would uh, make a kind of interpretation of this picture, this signal is something from the monsoon time one year earlier. So it's uh, this is what we can interpret a little bit in, in, in Bill's result. Okay, now we can define uh, two destination, 
regions where we can also quantify the amount of tracer. So I, and I do it in the tropical pipe. And here in the, in the northern uh, lower, lower most stratosphere, or it's a lower stratosphere, and calculate the time uh, evolution of this tracer. So you see the time evolution from, for, the, for the northern hemisphere. It's calculated for 380K for the tropics, so for the, for the tropical pipe, and for the southern hemisphere. So if you release a tracer close to the tropopause in the Asian monsoon region, most of the material goes to the northern hemisphere, to the lowermost stratosphere, northern hemisphere. And uh, uh, a part of this, uh, of course, a significant part, but compared with that, what goes to the northern hemisphere, less goes into the, into the tropical pipe. This is at 400K, so it's a signal is a little bit higher, and 460K is a little bit later, and the signal is becoming smaller. And at least if you release the tracer from this level, the signal into the southern hemisphere is very small. That's what you get from this type of analysis. And um, so the strongest contribution is to the northern hemisphere, something like 15% here, and uh, transport to the tropical pipe is less than 5%. This is what we got from the model. What was concluded in this paper is that the vertical transport across the tropopause, uh, kind of chimney, I think Laura created this uh, this, this name, chimney, in, with respect to the transport across the tropopause, is consistent with Garni and Randall, but much more isentropic transport into the northern hemisphere, extra tropical lowermost stratosphere, something like 50%, and into the tropical pipe. So roughly speaking, if you imagine this anticyclone, it's kind of circulation that crosses the tropopause, so the, the chimney is crossing the tropopause, and then the blower is working, let's, which start to redistribute this tracer slightly above the tropopause, mainly into the lowermost stratosphere, into the northern hemisphere lowermost stratosphere, but also a significant part goes to the uh, tropical pipe. Okay, and now I'm going to my, um, to my, uh, Last part of the presentation is a recently accepted paper by ACP from Xia Lu Yan. The efficiency of transport into the stratosphere via the Asian and North American side monsoon circulations. So we follow this way what Felix started with the quantification of transport and extended it a little bit. So what is now new, what is kind of new uh, approach? We uh, Consider now three different destination, uh, uh, three different source regions first. So it is a Asian summer monsoon, the North American monsoon, and the tropics. So we we want to now to compare this transport between these three source region, and uh, every uh, in every source region we also consider two layers. So something like between 370 and 380 K, that is very close to the tropopause, and 350, 360 K, that's very, very close to the main convective outflow. And um, so in total, we have something like six source regions which are considered now, and we, we investigate the transport into the three different destination regions. So it's a lowermost northern hemisphere, lowermost southern hemisphere, into, and into the tropical pipe. The questions which are now interested, uh, or we, we which would, would like to, uh, to, to answer is, what is the contribution of the Asian summer monsoon in comparison to the North American monsoon? And what is the, compares, uh, what is the transport of both uh, monsoons with comparison to the tropics? And we also use a different reanalysis in order to get kind of robust uh, results. So we don't only use the error interim as a kind of background wind reanalysis driving clumps, but we also use MERA2 winds. So uh, here what you see is uh, in the lower part, this 370 to 380 K potential temperature, the propagation of the tracer is uh, so the source region is the source region uh, below the tropopause between 370 and 380 K. And uh, it's the same what, 
what Felix Plöger did uh, in his paper, but we have also the contribution of the Asian summer monsoon. And we also calculated the column of the, of the uh, released tracer. So you see something like here for the, uh, for the Asian summer monsoon, the most of the column is in the northern hemisphere. And uh, the North American monsoon contributes only very weak to, to all the signature. What is now interesting, if we go to the 350, 360 case, that is, you know, the layer, the main convective outflow where we release our tracer. Now the situation changed a, a little bit. So it's, it looks like that, that after, and everything is after 10 months of transport. So you, we released it something like July, August, and then after 10 months, so before the next monsoon season starts, we plot this type of the tracer. So you see, what happened after something like 10 months of transport. So what is interesting, if you go to the 350, 360 case, that is the layer a little bit lower, so that is the main convective outlaw, we have a very strong contribution into the southern hemisphere. So you, if, you, if you look on the column, so the column is even higher for the southern hemisphere than in the northern hemisphere. That is interesting. It is you know, something like the Asian monsoon stuff or stuff released uh, the material released uh, in all these regions over the monsoons is going to the southern hemisphere. And uh, you have also this kind of, uh, of contribution uh, with HCN. So this dashed is always this HCN from the, from the satellite. So from this type of analysis, you can say that the both layers uh, contribute to this HCN. And especially the uh, Asian summer monsoon dominates everything. The North American uh, monsoon is much, much weaker. So what we conclude is that the traces released close to the tropopause, 370, 380K, are primarily transported into the Northern Hemisphere. And traces released clearly below the tropopause, something like 350, 360K, are transported to the tropical pipe and even to the Southern Hemisphere. And this uh, feature is robust if we change the reanalysis. So if we go to the MERA2, and in MERA2, the upwelling is, is much, much weaker. Uh, so the vertical velocities in the, in the, in the lower uh, tropical stratosphere are smaller than in era interim. But you, you, uh, you get a very similar feature, and always the North American monsoon is weaker than the Asian summer monsoon. The, the Asian summer monsoon is something like three times stronger if you compare the amount of the transported tracers. If you go to the kind of horizontal picture of this transport that is known as a horizontal tape recorder, so once again, here is 370, 380K, so it is a layer close below the tropopause. You see <clears throat> that uh, in the Asian summer monsoon and also in the American monsoon, the stuff or this material goes mainly to the, to the north. But if you, if you start at 350, 360K, a significant part goes across the equator by the Asian summer monsoon and by the north uh, uh, American monsoon. Everything is weaker, but the signature is, is similar. So what we deduce, we have something like two pathways uh, of transport into the, tropical path, uh, in, into the tropical pipe. So the first one is uh, this um, uh, monsoon pathway, this kind of classical pathway, what people believe that this material is transported by convection and then uh, uh, something like uh, trapped by the anticyclone and within the anticyclone like a chimney transported across a tropopause and then like a blower transported into the tropical pipe. But if you, at least in our simulation, we see if, you, if we release the tracer in the 350, 360K, we have also a significant transport first to the tropics. And this is what we believe because of the Headley cell. So in summer, the Headley cell is shifted to the north. And that the transport from the anticyclone to the, to the equator is possible. And then the tropical upwelling transport everything upwards. So something like more than half of the mass released between 350 and 360 K follows this tropical pathway. Implication for the water vapor. 
that's what we also did in this paper. <clears throat> you can uh, plot this classical vertical uh, picture of the tape recorder. So uh, the black line is a wet anomaly of the tape recorder calculated uh, uh, from, uh, from MLS. So the black lines is uh, always so 0 0.4, 0 0.6 is, uh, is a wet phase of the, uh, of the tape recorder. And you see how, uh, how uh, the material, this artificial traces propagate along uh, or in the same way like, like the water vapor, like the, like the wet phase of the tape recorder. This line is because, you know, this is of the design of our simulation. So we, we, we put the tracer for 10 months, and after 10 months, we put everything to zero, and then you see this kind of repeating uh, feature. Once again, 370, 380K, so the layer close to the tropopause is here. And uh, the contribution seems to be weaker of this tracer. And if you go to the 350, 360 case, this contribution is higher. So um, in the top, it's mainly through the tropical pathway, and in the bottom is mainly through the monsoon pathway. And you can also correlate now the water vapor with uh, so the clumps water vapor with the tracer. And you see <coughs> the tracer-tracer correlation. So it's a tracer correlation between water vapor and the uh, and this artificial tracers for the Asian summer monsoon and for the North American monsoon. Here, uh, the, the lower part is 370, 380K. So you know for the tracer release close to the tropopause, and you see only one branch. This is kind of wet branch. So and if you go to the 350, 360K, you see two branches. And uh, so this is kind of wet and the dry branch, and a little bit similar for the North uh, American summer monsoon, but everything is much, much weaker. So what we conclude, we have two contributions to the wet phase of the water vapor, uh, of the, of the water vapor tape recorder, the tropical pathway, this magenta arrow, which is drier, and it contains more young air, this black lines, you can find it in the paper. We can also calculate the age spectrum for this, and from the age spe spectrum, we can also com calculate the contribution of the young air. So this uh, tropical pathway is uh, mainly young, and this monsoon pathway is a little bit older. It needs a little bit more time, and is also, you know, something like affected by inmixing from the uh, from the stratosphere. So this is what we learned from this paper, monsoon tracers released close to the tropopause are primarily transported into the northern hemisphere. Monsoon tracers released cl clearly below the tropopause, 350, 360, are more transported to the tropical pipe and even to the southern hemisphere. So it depends in which altitude you start this type of simulation. Asian summer monsoon is always weaker than North American summer monsoon. And we identified kind of two pathways of transport from the summer monsoon regions into the tropical pipe. The monsoon pathway that is confined, uh, kind of, uh, defined by a strong confinement by the anticyclone, and that is slower and moister. So this is this type of pathway. And the tropical pathway is a headlay cell, or the part of the headlay cell, and the tropical upwelling. And this pathway uh, is faster and drier. This was something what we concluded from our second paper. And this is also the end of my talk. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Are there any questions? That was extremely interesting. So um, one question came to mind is, can you tell what the relative amount of, amount of material transport in the monsoons is relative to material going into the stratosphere elsewhere in the tropics? Or, uh, yeah. It's, uh, I think, the number what I can give you is something like uh, the material which, which, which goes to the tropical lowermost stratosphere is something like 15%, and into the tropical pipe is 5% from the monsoon region. Right. And, and you would like to compare it to it with, the, with the tropics? Oh. The tropics in general, yes. Yeah. 
that is what what we also did. That is, you know, kind of good question because I also prepared something. And it's um, if you want to compare tropics with uh, monsoon regions, the south regions are very very different. You know, the tropics are huge, <laughs> and this monsoon region is is much much smaller. So what we included in the paper is a so-called transport efficiency. Transport efficiency is something like normalized uh, tracer. So roughly speaking, we divide by the source, uh, by the mass of the source region in order to get comparable quantities. And then what do, what do, uh, what do you get, for example, for the tropical pipe? For the tropical pipe, it's a comparison between the uh, Asian summer monsoon is a solid line, and tropics is a dotted line. So you see both contribution are very similar. So roughly speaking, if you have, let us say, one kilogram of pollutions, and you would distribute it uniformly over the tropics, or one kilogram of pollution, and you would distribute it uniformly over this Asian monsoon layer, the 370, 380, and the anticyclone, you would get the same result in the tropical pipe. So, and because the Asian monsoon is much, much smaller yeah, compared with the tropics, the efficiency is, is very comparable. So it's... So for example, for water vapor, if you don't do this normalization, would you get the tropics overwhelmingly dominating over the monsoons? It's, uh, I think it's also a paper from uh, Matthias Nutzel who, who analyzed the water vapor. And he found that the contribution of the monsoon for water vapor is not so large for the tropics. So, it's, so the tropics, at least in respect to water vapor, are still dominating. So it's something like, I think, 0 0.6 ppm. So if you have, let us say, in the wet phase of the tape record, you have, let us say, 6 ppm water vapor, or maybe 7. So less than 1 ppm of this is because of this monsoon pathway. Uh, uh, I would like to ask about the diffusive uh, question. Yes. So one of the advantage of the Lagrangian model is a diffusive. Uh, is has no diffusive problem like like the Euler Ola model. And uh, so when you have compare compare with uh, Bill's pa paper uh, of this transportation, it looks quite similar. So yeah. how could this non-diffusive like contribute to like like well, make this? You uh, mean uh, if like I, I mean which part might be because of the diffusive and uh, you did not find yes uh, so yeah it's um, I think it's 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 a good question and it's it's a kind of zonal mean what I present here so you know there are also many. Uh, many other factors. But um, I think the one important thing, if, 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 if you remember my um, motivation, so it's clumps a combination of the diabetic thinking and mixing. <laughs> and, mm. and this diabetic thinking is, is uh, included into the vertical velocities. And ver vertical velocities, you know, this diabetic heating rates, is something what we get from the reanalysis. So one important part of transport is this, is this vertical transport. Another part is what you mean is this mixing part. Um, to check it really, you know, you would have to do something similar with the Eulerian model to see the difference. Yeah. And what we can also do, at, le at least in the Lagrangian model, we can completely switch off our mixing. Yeah? Because we can, you know, we can something like use only pure trajectories. Or we can also put too much mixing. That is the advantage of this Lagrangian okay. model. So we can, we can go from mixing zero to mixing very strong. We didn't do it for this type of picture, so I cannot directly answer your question. But it's what we did in the past. And, uh, and it looks like that the, that the Eulerian model with the same resolution, they don't, re, uh, don't resolve the edge of the polar vortex, for example, in the right way. They don't resolve the, the, uh, the transport barriers, especially. The transport barrier is something that is very well resolved in this Lagrangian type of the model. And this is a consequence of this mixing, if you want. 
For this case, I cannot really answer your question, but in general, it would be something like this. Yeah, so when you look at different areas, do you assume different mixing? No, no, the mixing is, no, the mixing is always uh, driven by the deformation of the flow. So, you know, oh, okay. and this is something that is given by, by your flow from outside. So the flow is prescribed as kind of something strong deforming or sometimes not deforming, okay. and then the mixing is working. So it's, it's, it's not something like a free oh, parameter like, in this sense. Yeah. You said it, it's like it's, calculated. It's, 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 to some extent, it's a free parameter, this Lyapunov exponent, if you remember. This, uh, it's a critical parameter where we say when we switch, uh, switch on the mixing. Okay. This was uh, adjusted to the experimental data. Yeah? So it's not something like a priori or derived from the lab or whatever, but it's, 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 it's something that is uh, adjusted to the experimental data. But it was done at the beginning, and then we use all, all the same setup of this uh, mixing and do always the same type of calculations. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, and so has a really strong impact on the Hadley circulation. So during an El Nino year, Hadley circulation tends to contract and strengthen, and then La Nina tends to do the opposite. So have you looked any into the interannual variability in that tropical not, transport pathway? Not for this case. Okay. Yeah. So we have, we have only four years what we took. We have also, we do it normally if we do our 40 years calculation, for example, for water vapor, you need always all these variabilities, but not for this case. So we have only four years, and I agree there is a variability. There are more questions? Can you go back just a slide where you summarized your 5% and your 15% numbers? Yes. Uh, Up. So this is 5% of the mass coming up through the monsoon is seen in the tropical pipe, right? Yes. And 15% then goes to the Northern Hemisphere extratropical yes. transfer. Where's the other 80% go? <laughs> uh, everywhere. <laughs> Elsewhere. Yeah. It's, okay. it's, not, it's not quantified here. So okay. we, you know, we, we took only two, so, uh, two destination regions, so, you know, uh -huh. the tropical pipe and the lowermost stratosphere. Uh -huh. If you would take the remaining atmosphere, uh -huh. so you will, will find this missing how many? Uh, 80%. 80 percent. Seems yeah. like a lot of things to look into. Yeah, yeah, but it's uh, kind of uniformly yeah, okay. mixed. So it actually goes back down. Yeah, it's a big part. It also goes down. That's it's true. Okay. Mm. Interesting. Are there more questions? Okay. No. But okay. but uh, maybe one one small comment. You know, I would not uh, em emphasize too much the number itself. Yeah, I would always emphasize kind of. Uh, uh, let us say that the northern hemisphere is three times larger than the tropical pipe. That's what is kind of robust for me. Or that the, uh, uh, that the Asian monsoon is much stronger than the American monsoon. That is robust. Yeah? Or uh, that if you go from 370 to the main convective outlaw, much bigger part goes to the tropics and even to the southern hemisphere. That's, this is kind of robust. All these numbers, if you, if you change the reanalysis, if you take MERA2, you, you get different numbers. But the kind of ratio is, is still there. Hmm. Thank you, Paul. Please, let's thank again, Paul.